I was introduced as a guide outfitter, but in fact, I, I'm a hunter. Uh, and just to give you an idea of where I sit in the hunting world, I was given the Professional Hunter of the Year Award in 2009, given the International Hunter of the Year and the World Conservation and Hunting Award in 2012, Conklin Award in 2016 for the highest standards in ethical and fair chase, 2018, the Ovis Award for fair chase and total integrity, 2018, the winner of the Weatherby Award, only the second Canadian in 70 years to uh, be given that award. So, so I'm, a, I'm a hunter. I've also produced over 500 episodes of outdoor television uh, and worked closely with the First Nations and the Inuit communities in the North. I've written over 100, a art, 1,000 articles in uh, outdoor publications. And uh, on a personal note, I've been married for 38 years to my soulmate and uh, have two children and four grandchildren. And most importantly for, for this committee, you know, I, I have a great and growing concern for the, the public safety of my family here in Canada and my fellow Canadians. Uh, but speaking as a hunter, I wanna make it clear to this committee that uh, although I live the field to table lifestyle and people like me live this lifestyle where, where we go into the field, we, we hunt what we eat, we're not your enemy. Uh, hunters are, are not the enemy in this case and our, our firearms are not a threat to, to the security of, of Canada and, and safety of Canadians. You know, so, so I'll address some of these uh, C21 issues that, are, that concern us as hunters. You know, semi-automatic rifles, are they popular? Yes, they are. They're commonly used for hunting many different species of animals in many different conditions. Uh, just to get a hunting license, hunters have to be, uh, they have to pass tests, they're vetted. Uh, they're the best at knowing what's uh, the proper firearm to use. I don't use weapon because I, that's not what these are. They're, I don't think they qualify as weapons in the, the uh, Canadian Criminal Code. You can confirm that. But uh, uh, and semi-automatic rifles are are commonly used. Shotguns are commonly used. Uh, most uh, outfitting that I look after takes place in remote communities, mostly Indigenous First Nations, Inuit territories, and and the economic benefits of the, the hunters that come in, mostly from the States, and often they use their, their semi-automatic firearms. They, if this goes through C21, my fear is that you're gonna see a boycott from down South, which will be a catastrophic, have a catastrophic effect on these communities, remote, remote communities that require this input of, of foreign dollars, American dollars into those communities. And, and by the way, the meat from the animals taken in these communities goes to those communities, to the elders. My Rogue River Outfitting Territory, we, we donate uh, several tons of meat to the elders that, are, that can't go hunting. And we provide them with the traditional pieces of, of the animals, the nose, the, the cull fat, pieces that they don't get and, and rely on. And, and I, you know, the dangerous animals, another reason, semi-automatic guns are, are the best defense. I think the Yukon government actually uh, AR-10s, or I think that's what they're called. I'm, not, I'm a hunter, not a, not a gun guy, but, but I think they selected those for their conservation officers after studies that proved that they were the best to use. And they are in dangerous situations. Uh, so, so again, I, you know, I don't want to take a pile of your time here. I'm, I'm a hunter and I'm obviously out of place uh, with all of you here, those are not elephant tusks on that side, by the way, those are woolly mammoth tusks. But but I wanna say that you, you mentioned respect for hunters. And I think that's really important that uh, everybody understands that hunters are not a threat to your safety and not to the national security of this country. And, and yet we feel vilified and marginalized. Recently, we feel attacked. We're, we're not the enemy. You know, we're love our country. And, uh, you know, the, the taking of life, the taking away of life is, is a terrible, terrible thing, obviously wrong, you know, fundamentally wrong. But, but the taking of a way of life is also wrong. And, and I just, back to the respect for hunters, I, I, I'm here because I would like the respect, you know, 
and I'm speaking for hunters across Canada, we, we just feel like we're, we've been turned into criminals with this. And, and I think there's some serious flaws to this, to this uh, C21. And I recognize and I appreciate what the previous speakers have said, uh, but, but you know, there's some untruths in this. And, and uh, like I say, as, as speaking as a hunter and, and for the hunting community, what you saw when you try to pass the amendments, yes. uh, you uh, wrap up, sir. They're, they're, it's, it's, we're fearful, and uh, we're not, we're not, we're not the problem here. Thank you. So we'll start our questioning with. Uh, we'll go to our uh, first round with uh, Madame Dancho. Thank you, Five Mr. Uh, sorry, six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the witnesses for being here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shockey, for being online. Uh, I'd just like to say I appreciate the honesty, and I feel that everyone is speaking from their heart, and I appreciate the uh, the very raw sentiments that are being brought forward. And I think uh, I can speak certainly for our team that we are looking to have a very respectful dialogue and consultation today and in the coming meetings. So I very much appreciate the tone put forward by all of you to start this uh, this consultation process today. Uh, Mr. Shockey, I have a few questions for you to start off. Uh, you mentioned uh, the in economic impact of hunting in the north. Now, I'm not overly familiar. I'm not from the north. I'm from rural Manitoba. But uh, my understanding is a large part of the indigenous diet in uh, northern Canada, uh, particularly where your outfitter is, uh, in the tens of thousands of pounds of meat that they are provided, are in fact from the American hunters that your outfitter uh, guides. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, and and I, you know, I mean, uh, what the Americans do for us up in the north in the remote communities is uh, is is a very positive thing. And uh, you know, I, I, the one fellow mentioned a name he he doesn't want to mention, but I'll mention it. Americans coming up there, spending their dollars, economic benefits are, are huge in the communities. And for the vast majority of the Americans that come up, they donate the meat to the elders in those communities. And in my case, in the Rogue River Outfitting Territory. In the Yukon, uh, the the Mayo Band, the elders receive the meat, and and as I said earlier, not just the meat as we know meat, uh, steaks and whatnot. They they get the cull fat, the kidneys, the diaphragm, the nose, or, you know, all these pieces that that we, you know, the American hunters yeah. donate to the elders, and and it allows them to maintain their traditional lifestyles, even though yeah. they're too old. Thank you very much. Old. Yeah, we, I appreciate that information. I think it's a very important part. There was no economic uh, assessment done uh, with the amendments, and I, and I think that this is an important part. If there should be an impact from any ban like this that goes forward to recognize what that might be and how to mitigate it. Uh, sir, and how many, sir, would you say, what is the percentage of um, American hunters that your outfitter provides? And I know there's thousands of uh, outfitters. I know very uh, very well that the outfitters, for example, in, uh, in rural northern Manitoba are, are greatly benefited by American hunters and certainly when the border was closed for COVID they took a huge hit as did the indigenous guides that they employ so what what if you can give me a ballpark percentage of uh how many what is the percentage of American hunters that you have would you say 97 percent ballparking it uh you know certainly over 95 percent Okay. Uh, so if, as you mentioned, and I have been hearing this from others, but that uh, in the event that this ban and uh, moves forward, uh, we may see a complete decline or drop off of American hunters coming up to Canada. Uh, and, that, and I just want to confirm in your opening remarks, you mentioned that as well? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, I, I mean, I know most of the American players, and if they got on the bandwagon to, to boycott Canada, for as a hunting destination, uh, I, I think it would be catastrophic to the industry and to the northern community. Thank you. And I know, of course, Canadian hunters, uh, many of my family members engage in northern outfitters as well. Uh, I do want to talk, you mentioned semi-automatics, and I, I shared with you previously the specific definition of those that were looking to be banned by uh, by G, uh, G4. Uh, how common would you say that those are? You mentioned in your opening remarks, but just to reiterate. Yeah, they're common, and it's a personal choice of each hunter. The, uh, you put 10 hunters together, there'll be 10 different opinions on what is the proper firearm for a given situation. As an outfitter for the last 30 years, I've seen many, many semi-automatics uh, come up. Certainly, and that's, so that's not just popular with Americans, but also Canadians, is that correct? 
100%. Okay. True. I also want to speak to, uh, you work a lot with Indigenous hunters in particular, and I do think this is a very important piece uh, as well, because we've heard from the Inuit community uh, that there is the issue of, of polar bears and protection against wild animals. Why would a semi-automatic of the definition uh, in G4, why would that be or would that be the best tool available in Canada currently uh, should uh, a northern individual uh, come across a polar bear, for example? Like, can you explain that for the community? Can you break that down? Yeah, it, it is the choice. And it's the choice in Africa of professional hunters going after dangerous game. For the average hunter as well, it's it's the ability to, to you know, there's no such thing as overkill in a situation when your life's in, in danger. And so in the Inuit communities, they'll even take the trigger guard off their firearms so that they can, in cold weather, hit the trigger with their mitt. And and you can't work a bolt. I mean, it's cold. Uh, semi-automatic, to me, would be the choice that I would recommend if uh, if I was asked as a professional, as I said, uh, you know, consider to be one of the top hunters in the world. Right. And uh, of course, I, I know that you're a very gifted hunter and you're a very good shot, but not all hunters uh, are necessarily capable of taking out a predator that is uh, coming at them with one. Uh, so just my understanding is given the, the structure of a semi-automatic uh, manga and particularly a rifle, it, it just ensures the best case scenario for you in, in the event you come across a polar bear. I think you've come across two situations or three situations where uh, you were under attack by a cougar as well as two bear encounters. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's correct. I wouldn't be speaking here right now if it uh, if I hadn't reacted properly in all three situations. Well, thank you very much for sharing this information. I'm just out of time, but I appreciate you providing some uh, understanding to the committee regarding the realities of Northern Canada and the benefits, certainly the economic benefits to Indigenous communities and uh, to the outfitter industry in Canada as well. So, thank you very much, Mr. Shockey. You're welcome.